Testing, good. <laughs> good morning, everybody. Good morning here in the sanctuary. Good morning over the internet. Uh, and welcome to our Worship Matters session 22. Uh, today, we are going to kick off with a little series on the organ. And this is part one, so we're going to look at the history of the organ. I decided to split it in half. It's way too long. I thought I could sort of encapsulate everything into one program, and it's just impossible. So I will do a two-parter on the history of the organ. Uh, this morning, we're going from ancient times into the Baroque era. So that's the 16th century. So that's the time of Bach and Handel and Haydn. And uh, so if we could scroll... Good, so we're going to start off with the ancient history of the organ. It is believed that the inspiration for building the organ came from an ancient instrument called the syrinx, which is sort of like a pan flute. And this led to an instrument called the hydrolis. The hydrolis, also called the Roman water organ, uh, was invented by Tisibius of Alexandria. This is during the time of the Ptolemaic era. This is when the Greeks took over Egypt, and this is during the third century BC. Now, Tisibius was an engineer who experimented with the elasticity and the applications of water, and he experimented things like water clocks and uh, invented a lot of uh, toys and things that used steam. So it was a very, very fascinating life for this man, and he came up with the idea of using water as a kind of a bellows to provide air um, for this instrument. It was a big reservoir with pump action that would pump the water to and fro, and thereby creating an airflow for the instruments to blow through the pipes. Uh, hydrolis was often used in Roman arena events, uh, one of the unfortunate things with the history of this instrument is that, yes, it was often played while Christians were being thrown to the lions, unfortunately. The instrument sound, sounded apparently very, very bright and fluty. To the Roman ears, it, it was loud and it, it sort of bombastic, but from the reproductions that I've heard on YouTube, it is not. Um, it is a fascinating sound. Very, very bright, very fluty. There you can see a, a, a Roman fellow pumping away there at the pump action while that other gentleman there in his nice robe is playing on a rudimentary keyboard. It was basically just flat wooden slats. But apparently the touch was so delicate that they could play far more complicated pieces than one would think on such an instrument. Next one. There is a modern reproduction um, this is a group of people who actually, they are on YouTube. You can type on YouTube Roman water organ or hydrolis and you can hear how the thing sounds for yourself. As you can see there, it's not awfully massive. Uh, there's a fellow pumping the pump action down there. I'm assuming that gentleman who looks like he's in ecstasy is probably singing and the other one is playing. Okay, next. Um, unfortunately, as far as I know, there's no music for the instrument in, in existence, so I can't even play anything for you. They sort of make up tunes on their own that sound sort of ancient Roman on the videos. Uh, we're moving now to the medieval and the Renaissance period. Now, the medieval comes immediately after uh, uh, this ancient period. This is the time of the portative organ and it is a small pipe organ. It often had a keyboard, of course. It rested on the knee, or you had a neck strap, so you could carry it around. It was often used in processionals, including religious processionals. The right hand played keys, while the left hand operated bellows at the rear of the instrument. It had, it's got a very unusual sound. They are still in existence. There are companies that still build them. Um, mostly European, very beautiful. They have a very unusual, almost eerie sound. It, it, it's not like the church pipe organ that we know. It's very bright, it's very fluty. 
one of the instru interesting things about this instrument is that the player can control the tone, the timbre, and the expressive volume levels by manipulating this bellows and even shaking it to create some pretty interesting effects. To me, it kind of sounds like a fluty version of an accordion. Very, very fascinating. Again, you can go onto the internet and actually listen to some pretty interesting virtuosos uh, playing this instrument, uh, amongst lots of other old reproduction instruments too. Okay, next slide. There's an old picture. Now, usually when you see a lady and there's a little cherub and whatever, it's usually Saint Cecilia that they are representing. Saint Cecilia is the patron saint of poets, uh, singers, musicians, and especially organists. So there's, there's an old Renaissance painting. Next. Here is a lady. She's on the internet. Uh, she does some incredible playing. She's a virtuoso. She specializes, she's from Italy, she specializes in old, old instruments that have been reproduced. The instrument she's playing is made in Denmark. There is a company that makes these instruments. And as you can see, it looks like a pipe organ, regular pipes, keyboard, not very big keyboard, about an octave, an octave and a half. And there on the side, you can see the bellows and her other hand is there manipulating that. Okay, next. There's a, another model from the same Danish company. Um, you can see little wooden things there above the keys of the keyboard, right? Sometimes um, medieval and Renaissance music uses a drone sound. That's just one pitch, like a bagpipe. Just this uh, going throughout the whole thing. And sometimes they would attach these things to, to press down on a key and keep it there. There is also a special clip and an attachment that you can use on a regular organ to do the same thing. That you can clip a certain note that you want to have droning. Very fascinating stuff. Next. Uh, here's another kind of portative organ. It requires a person to stand behind there and operate two bellows. This is another European company. I think that's Italian. Okay, next. Good. Okay, so now we're coming into uh, the positive organ. Now, of course, as builders became more creative, got more experience, they want to go bigger and bigger and bigger, right? So now we get to the positive organs. Don't think by any long shot that the portative organ stopped being played. It was still very popular. It's like hymns. You know, you have classical hymns, contemporary hymns, praise and worship songs all happening at the same time. So these instruments would still be used. The portative organ is simply, a, I mean the positive organ is a larger version of the portative. It's perhaps a little less portable. Um, it definitely stands on the ground. It is bigger. Usually one manual and maybe one, if you're lucky, two stops, two voices operated by two bellows at the rear that were pumped by a separate person. Tone was similar, or is, they still exist, to the portative organ, but it was louder. Now here you start losing some of your expressive abilities because the bellows were weighted and balanced. There was no ability to press harder to make it sound louder or brighter or whatever like the, uh, uh, like the portative organ could. Okay, next. There's an example. Uh, that lady that I showed you earlier with the portative organ also plays these. And you can just barely see at the back there's one of the bellows anyway. No pedals. Uh, pedals did exist during the medieval and the Renaissance period, but they were very, very rudimentary and not all organs had them. Okay, next one. There's different models, different eras. Later on, builders were starting to build the uh, uh, positive organs in different styles. They were popular right through the Baroque era, even on, up to this day. They're used as practice instruments. This one has two bellows for the feet, kind of like a harmonium. So you don't need a separate person pumping away there. Here you can see wooden pipes on the sides. 
apart from the metal ones. Okay, next. Here's a modern one. Look at the shutters, isn't that cute? So when you finish playing, you shut her up so that she will be safe and no dust and dirt. Uh, modern ones, of course, are electric blown. They have electric motors and they have full pedals like a regular pipe organ. Oftentimes they will be used like at universities in little practice rooms. Uh, people do buy them. You can get kits or you can buy entire organs, especially from Holland. Uh, for your home. My organ teacher had one in his home. It, it was actually quite cute. All right, next. Now we go into what we can identify more as a church organ. Okay, similar to the positive organs that we were just looking at, but larger with several stops, rudimentary pedals were featured. Uh, however, they usually did not have their own pipes. Okay, today's organs, the pedals have their own pipes that you draw, their own stops. So they were sort of reliant on the, 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 the manuals. They were often just coupled. Bellows behind the organ. This will carry on straight through the Baroque era, where there's bellows operators behind the instrument. So bellows were behind the organ, operated by a separate person. And yes, they were paid a fee. <laughs> Uh, even wind pressure, again, so the wind pressure could not alter, so the instruments were quite expressionless, meaning that what you hear is what you get. You can't make the instrument louder or softer except for adding more pipes and more stops. Uh, that'll come later on in the Baroque era. Okay, next. This is interesting. There is a very old organ in Switzerland up in the Alps. There's a fortress that has its own basilica, and it is the oldest operational organ in the world. It's the oldest playable organ. I don't know if you folks know Diane Bish from The Joy of Music. She had this TV program where she would travel around the world and play different pipe organs. Well, she's on the internet playing this thing. You might want to have a look at that. Very interesting. So that's the Basilique de la Valère à Sion in uh, Switzerland. It was built around 1430. There are other old instruments around about that time and later and before that do exist in the world, especially in Spain, but they have usually fallen into disrepair. Uh, the sound is very bright and clear, very, almost shrill to my ears. And when it echoes through the building, it's like, whoa, it, it's not what you expect from, you know, a pipe organ, right? It, it's 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 totally different sound. It, its pitch, its tuning system is totally bizarre. It's really different to what we're used to. So if you get a chance to to have uh, listened to Diane Bish playing this uh, basilica at Sion in Switzerland, do give it a go. Okay, next. There's the fortress up on the hills. Isn't that just ever so picturesque? The basilica is in there. It's part of it. I believe it's off here to the side. All right, next. That is up where the organist plays. There's the old wooden keyboard. Only one. Very small little pedals, very rudimentary. That is the stop knobs. I think there are only like six stops. And look at the handwriting above them to tell you what they are. Goodness, I can't even make that out. It's so old. And those metal rods are pulled to open the, the pipes and then to close them, to shut them up. Okay, next one. That's what it looks like from a distance. That's from inside the church. And the next slide, you will see it up close. Look at the paintings. Very ornate. Now... You have to access these instruments, of course, from another, an, another doorway. There's a spiral staircase that you come up the back to, to get in there. A lot of old cathedrals are like that. You'll see the organ just sort of hanging on the wall, and you're like, how on earth? But there are staircases and things. And those are shut, closed when the organ is not in use. At the back of this ornate case, you can just make out wooden, big wooden pipes. Standing up there, those are usually low-pitched pedal pipes. All right, next slide. 
So I've got two, uh, three examples. Well, one is actually a hymn that uh, we will be joining together. So the first one is a very, very old uh, uh, organ piece. Shiritzula Maritzula. Apparently it's based, <laughs> it's based on an old Italian dance. It's a very short piece. <clears throat> But you can sort of get the idea of a little bit of droning in there as well. And Gagliarda is also another dance. And uh, it was specifically arranged for modern organs by Alexandre Guimard. Because originally there was no part written for pedals. But he wrote a part for pedals. Then we're going to look at an ancient plain, plain chant. We're not going to sing all the verses because it goes on forever. Uh, Stabat Mater, at the cross her vigil keeping. Um, and I will start off singing one verse in Latin, and then the, we will do the English verses. Okay. And by the way, I have set this organ to sound in the ancient tone system, so it is going to sound very different.
So there's a little bit of taste of medieval church music. <laughs> Sounds a little bizarre for what we're used to, isn't it? Um, with that tuning system, the organ always sounds a little bit brighter, a little bit higher, and a little bit brighter. One fascinating thing, I don't actually have it on PowerPoint, but I'll share it with you, that through the ages, the pitches have actually dropped. The tuning systems have dropped. They've gone flatter and flatter and flatter. Uh, by the time we get to the 19th century and the turn of the 20th century, we're now at our rather very flat tuning system. So it has gone down. So if we were to travel back in time to the 15, 14, 1600s, music would have sounded a lot brighter and a lot higher. And uh, it seems like a lot of singers, people were able to sing a lot higher. If you have old, old, old hymnals, you'll be surprised how high they seem to go. It's just incredible. And, you know, now with new hymnals coming out, they're dropping and dropping and getting lower. Uh, so as a result, today's music can sound a little fluffy because it, it, it's getting flatter and flatter in pitch. Okay, next one. Now we're getting into the Baroque era. So this is the 1700s. 1600s, coming into the early 17. Principles and traditions regarding organ building from the earlier periods were still present. So we're still seeing things like portative organs and, and so on and so forth still being used in the Baroque era. Um, the Baroque era seems to have started in Italy in fact, a lot of artistic especially, and, and musical movements seem to start in Italy. The Renaissance started in Italy. Uh, the Baroque seems to have started in Italy as well. Um, here we start seeing organs getting bigger and bigger, with bigger, bigger sounds. So they're now coming closer to what we can now identify as your classical pipe organ. There was an increase in tonal varieties and more imitative stops. Now I'll explain to you what those mean. If you're not an organist, that can be pretty muddy. So different voices were starting to come out that were never used before. More different kinds of flute stops, more different kinds of trumpet stops, more different kind of string stops that sounded imitative. 
So you could have a trumpet stop that is meant to imitate an orchestral trumpet, a clarinet stop that's meant to imitate a clarinet, an oboe stop that's supposed to sound like an oboe, uh, violin, viola, and so on and so forth that's meant to imitate stringed instruments. Of course, they never come 100% perfect, but it's the organ's version of those sounds. Uh, we will see more and more and more of this orchestral type stops coming around in the Romantic era, the, the Victorian era. Pedal boards were now starting to become more common, except Britain. Now, this is a funny thing. Britain seems to have been a, at least four or five steps behind the rest of Europe. Um, organs were slow coming to Britain. It took a long time before Britain could establish their own builders to build the instruments. Pedal boards were not used in, in English organs pretty much until the early 1800s. However, in Europe, the pedal board took off big time. Initially, like in the Renaissance and the medieval period, the short little small pedals were used kind of as a drone. But now the, the range of the pedals are getting bigger. The Germans, they had independent stops now. So you had what's called a pedal division with its own stop knobs with pipes specifically attached to the pedals. Normally very, very big, deep bass sounding pedals. Uh, very popular in Germany. In fact, the Germans were the ones who came up with the idea of creating a long pedal like this. The early organs, the pedals were very short, only about that long. They were short little stubby things. So it would have been quite a challenge to play, but the Germans were the ones that came up with the idea of making it long. Uh, they're hinged at the far end. That's where the hinge is on these pedals. And then when you push down on it, uh, if this was a real pipe organ, there would have been mechanisms attached to go and open up the big bass pipes. Okay, next one. Now we're starting to see a lot of independent free moving pedal parts written in organ music. They started becoming more and more complex and they were becoming more and more popular in organ compositions because players with the long big pedals were now able to play with two feet at the same time. So you could see a lot of runs, a lot of skips, hops and jumps and all sorts of things on the pedals you could not see before with the little stubby ones that were basically long sustained little drone notes because that's all you could do on them. We're seeing increase in, the si of course, the size of the organ. We're seeing an increase in organ divisions. So organ divisions, of course, the organs divided into segments that are separated into keyboards or as us organists call them, manuals, as opposed to pedals. Manuals played with a mano, and pedals played with the pedis. <laughs> so now we're seeing more and more uh, manuals appearing on the organ, and each manual has its own special division, and its own special pipes are sitting on its own special wind chest, so there's no sharing going on like in the old organs. The French were the first ones to introduce a very fascinating device to try and make the rather expressionless, even-toned organ a little more expressive and interesting. And they came up with a, sec a division on the organ called Orc de Récit, otherwise just sometimes called Récit. And what that is, is that's the top keyboard, the top manual. It contained probably the most read stops, probably the most imitative orchestral stops. And they were on their own wind chest and they were all enclosed in a gigantic wooden box. And on this, this, all the sides of this box were wooden Venetian blinds running up and down. And they devised a method to manipulate these shades, as they're called in organ terms, they're not just called blinds, but shades, swell shades. So there's a, a pedal, an expression pedal, 
just above the musical pedals on the organ that when the organist pushes it down, it opens up all the shades. And then when the organist pushes it back up, it shuts all the shades. So you can have this more expressive, because the pipes are inside this, so when you open the shades, it becomes louder and brighter and bigger sounding. And then when you shut the shades, it shuts down and becomes muted and quieter. So the French were the ones to come up with that idea. They have been indispensable for pipe organs ever since. I, I don't know of any organ today that does not have a, a Récy division, or as the English eventually called it, a swell, swell division in a swell box. Later on, there would be many divisions within their own special little swell boxes. <clears throat> There's increasing use of, in musical organ terms, it's French terms, increasing use of pleasure and grange. Now, what that means is pulling out all the stops at the same time to make a massive explosive sound. Now, the pleasure only used the stops that looked like flutes and that sounded like flutes, all the flue pipes were all drawn out at the same time, from very low to very high, and would create this brilliant, glistening tone. Grange includes the reed stops, so trumpets and trombone stops and tubas and so on and so forth. The French were notorious for their trumpets and tuba-type stops. They were very bright, very loud, um, certainly sounded like the angels breaking through at the last judgment day, blowing their trumpets. Very, very incredible grand jeu sounds. You will be hearing a lot of grand jeu playing when we go into the segment on the romantic organ, because that's where the French really shone. Okay, next. Some famous organ builders, just for fun, okay. Uh, some of the best builders actually came from northern Germany. Uh, that's not to say that other countries did not produce excellent builders either. But amongst the top was Arp Schnittger, Gottfried Silbermann, who worked alongside with Bach. So any ideas that Bach came up with, Silbermann implemented into his organs. Uh, Bach apparently was very, very, very harsh critic when it came to organs. If, if the organ stank, he, he would not mince his words. He would let you know this is not a good organ. In fact, the uh, Toccata and Fugue in D minor, the one that goes da -da 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 -bum, that one, he actually created that impromptu to test a new pipe organ. <coughs> Zilberman organs were popular all throughout Europe and influenced a lot of later builders. Robert Clichot, a very popular French builder at that time, Baroque organs are still very popular today. Uh, there's a new, there's a movement, I won't say it's new, it's been around for at least 20 odd years, but there's a movement called the Neo-Baroque style, where modern builders are now building organs modeled after this bright, brilliant, bell, clear, crystal clear type tone. Um, Gottfried Zilbermann's organs were very notorious for the shimmering, clear sound. Uh, and they've been gaining popular for a very long time amongst organists in churches. I can remember, I think, what I would easily say, 50% of the pipe organs I ever played, for example, in South Africa, were definitely neo-baroque. Very brilliant, very bright. Uh, to some people, maybe a little bit screamy. They kind of scream at you a little bit but definitely very bright. Okay, next one. That is a typical Zilbermann organ. As you can see with the typical Baroque style, very Rococo, angels blowing trumpets everywhere. Look at all the gold everywhere and all the scrolls and little squiggly things all over. Very, very ornate. Uh, next one. That is a typical Baroque console with all the stop knobs on the side like that. Uh, sometimes there would be a separate person who would accompany the organist, and when needed, this person would pull and push stops back in and out. Three manual version there. By the way, if you think the reverse black and white of the keys is exotic, that's how they originally were. 
Our keyboards, as they are now, came out much later. So early pianos, harpsichords, all keyboard instruments basically were like that. Or they were all wood. They were no two-tone. But generally, the, the main, the big keys were black and the, the accidentals were white in the old days. Some uh, organist, uh, organ builders today who replicate these old historical organs will use uh, keys like that. Next. There's a French organ, that's a typical clichot. That layout will stick with organ building for a very long time, especially amongst uh, the French organs. The French organ builders tended to put everything on, on the same platform, whereas the German builders would have different levels. But they would have the French organs would always be on the same platform with two big t towers on the sides. This, it looks like a separate tiny little pipe organ. That's called a positif and it's behind the organist. Uh, so the organist is actually nestled between the two cases there. Um, okay, next one. So I've got uh, some examples of uh, Baroque organ music. I can't do number three for you because for some weird reason my music just disappeared. <laughs> However, I do have, have two class, uh, typical Baroque pieces for you. Um, so today's program is going to be kind of short, but that's okay. Um, I don't know if you guys know, but I'm still recovering from a huge infection that I had. <laughs> so I was contemplating actually cancelling uh, today's presentation, so I kind of figured, you know what, I'll just do a shorter one. So we're going to look at a French piece. Actually, it's Italian, but it's got a French title. Uh, it's called uh, Echo pour Trompette. It features the trumpet stop. So you'll definitely get to hear that fiery French trumpet in the récit up top. And I'm going to play number seven of Johann Sebastian Bach's um, Acht kleine Preludien und Fugen. He wrote several little sets of small preludes and fugues rather than these gigantic, massive 15-minute things that he could come out with. And I was going to play Adagio in G minor. If you can, go onto the internet and listen to it. I'll give you a short history of it because it is very controversial and interesting. People are not actually sure if Tommaso Albanoni, who was a real person from the Baroque era, actually wrote it. But... Rimo Giazzotto, who was a person studying Tommaso Albanoni, um, apparently found a derelict fragment of music that supposedly uh, Tommaso Albanoni wrote. It was supposed to be part of a bigger suite, and he supposedly went to town with it and used it for a bigger composition. But yeah, there's, there's beautiful recordings on the internet. It was actually written for string, orchestra, and organ, not just organ solo, but it was supposed to have strings too. And then we will close off with Thine Be the Glory by Handel, which is, of course, typical Baroque. And we all love that Easter hymn, right? So that's a nice Baroque Easter hymn. So let's go with Echo pour Trompette. I've just got to change the tuning here to Baroque quickly. There we go.
Now, the trumpet stop I used there is actually a French trumpet, so it's very, very fiery and bright. The English trumpet from the English pipe organs tended to be mellower and softer sounding. So as you can imagine, you could not play pedals like that on the short little stubby Renaissance organ.
glory, risen, conquering Son. Endless is the victory thou, O death, has won. Angels in bright raiment built to soul with gladness hymns of triumph sing for her Lord now liveth death hath lost its sting thine be the glory risen conquering sun and this is the victory thou wrote death has won. No more we doubt the glorious Prince of Life. Life is not without thee, us in our strength. us more than conquerors through thy death and love. Bring us safe to Jordan for thy home above. Thine be the glory risen conquering sun Endless is the victory thou, O death, has won. Well, how about that? <laughs> So now you can see why Baroque organs are still popular, very bright, very brilliant, uh, very good for leading congregations. You need an instrument that can cut through the crowd so that everybody can hear them. And for those who have always wondered why do these beautiful organs always sit at the back of the church, high up on a balcony, it's for sound reasons, acoustic. It's better... To, to have it coming from above and behind you rather than blasting you straight from the front. So you get to hear people singing and the choirs much better. Look at that beautiful stained glass picture of the risen Christ. Thank you so much. Well, it's, it's a little shorter. It's only about 10 minutes shorter than usual. Um, next time we are going to look at part two uh, history of the organ from the classical era, so that's Mozart, the Mozart era. Mozart, by the way, loved the organ uh, up until the modern times. So we're going to cover uh, the classical era, the, the Romantic and uh, Victorian era, and we're going to come into the modern era and see what's happening with the pipe organ today. So that will be March the 17th at 11 a.m. Yes, it's St. Paddy's Day. I might throw a little bit of an Irish thingy in there just for fun, because the pipe organ is very popular in Ireland. Do yourself a favor. 
go on to YouTube and look at the pipe organ at St. Patrick's Cathedral in Dublin. It's a beautiful cathedral and the pipe organ is just to live for because you want to hear it again and again and again. Okay, folks, so that's uh, two weeks from now, March 17, 11 a.m. God bless you all. I hope that was informative and interesting. <laughs> and the, the next one should be just as interesting because now we're going to see a lot of very fascinating developments. Thank you all and goodbye. <laughs>